Aha! No break. Nobody takes a break when Hecky is involved. It's the day that will define the phrase make or break in the first of the three days before the total of downhill spiral. It's also the rise of Hecky as we begin the story of this uphill battle. He knows too well of feeling down and on the losing edge. The fans can joke around all day long. It's time for him to prove the doubters wrong. The chapter is a straightforward hype bill that showcases Hecky and his developing mentality to achieve brilliance in what it is a do or die event. In the last chapter, the Chung Rong has increased their army size greatly to end the fight for good on this very day. This one elaborates that Hecky's position isn't the only to be concerned because. Every position is about the same amount. It raises the stakes and potential death higher than before, which that seriously helped me to relax. It didn't. That's when Hecky realizes that the plan has been exposed. No longer feel like on the high ground. I doubt his word means there's a traitor on the loose. It's more a praise towards Sun Suiju's strategic move. Katarian says Hecky to fall back and change the position by having his man to go in front I laugh at Katari eagerness to kick them out already. When you don't look at the context, you would think she is eager to die. Heki's men have the uncertainty to upset Katari's request, but it will only fuel to Heki's rise as a true commander. It becomes clear by his response that Hara has begun setting up his character to be the true underdog. It's a bit baffling to look back at the older chapters and think Hecky would die as a prophetic piece of crap. While it is uncertain if he will make it out alive or not, he is definitely not going out with a whimper. He's on the rise with him declining a Mountain Tribe Fellows request, which could have been a ticket to enter easier mode. Instead, his manliness has increased and so has his pride to prove the man he is to Yotongwa. That's enough to make a man the man. It also helps the setting automatically place him in a position of a rookie playing the big league field. As straightforward the action is, it is compelling and somewhat inspiring when you follow the path of Heki's resolve to overcome the odds. Buna sends his men believe it to be an easy victory. Heki's men were feeling fear by not just numbers but their class. However, Heki doesn't back away and feels that their past experiences are enough to know how they work and believe the time to show off their strengths is now. It's very telling how his men thought about their stance when they felt no confidence on their strengths. They have the expression that reads like, strength? We have that? This only increases Heki's momentum as a commander. His command consists a classic wait and mark position with the archers taking their shot when the enemy fleet is close enough. Yet it was satisfying. It displays him further as the underdog of everything and he's holding up pretty well. His offense to defense is swift at clever timing. Even it is common sense. The point is those two wrong men are not so bright. Once they break through the archers, they have to deal with shield troopers, which dumbfounded them to attack and bull rush to their death. Probably the most impressive tactic is to use archers inside the formation, which is a tactic hardly done within this series history. Basically, they shoot from a close range position rather than from afar as you usually see or reminded many times before. This is a nice refreshing move to use, commanded by Heki no less. Despite a good tactic play by a man who is seen as a novice in compare with all others there, is more or less done by the book routine, meaning it's not extraordinary or mind-blowing, but that's completely fine. The most significant part that practically defines the chapter in a nutshell is the inspiring words from Heki and his stance. He knows his tactic isn't something to write home about, let alone flashiness. Hell, you can't say that Hara decided to give background character number 554 a moment to shine and leave you wondering, why this fodder? 
that's perfectly fine to him. Because as ordinary they are, and as weak they are in compare, he trusts his man more than anything. He has a true commander synergy when he can count his man to get the job done as well as executing the fundamental tactic at his best. When the rhythm gets going, he will eventually defeat Boonen and his men. That's a pretty bold statement. You may mock her for believing that chance, but it speaks volume of him for having this much momentum. It's a complete opposite on what he has gone through since the beginning of the war, which was an atrocious start. His mental state is completely healed, and he is throwing everything without reluctantly making foolish of himself. That's actually inspiring. Even Katari thought it was praiseworthy. Though Katari says otherwise. Yeah, she just can't give one credit. Seriously, can you at least give one ounce of credit? Boonin is pretty savage to call up the cavalry and order men to decapitate those who has failed. Wow, that's messed up. Waste of men, but whatever, I suppose. Normally, the infantry would have startled or scared the normal Chin army away, but Hekis continues to be impressive and encourage them that numbers won't determine the outcome. Quickly changes the formation into five-man squads and prepare for infantry combat. Proves that he has thought this through. It's a nice touch to Heki's uprising with him being the one to request his next command to Katari. It's a good contrast from earlier scene where the latter was the one requested to the former. I thought it was worth mentioning. Also, it's a classic case of great minds think alike, so there's no need to rewrite. I feel like the chemistry is growing and I can imagine they will be best of pals by the end. Katari is already gaining more respect for him, so I imagine Hara doing something special. It's interesting to note that Katari will be the one to kill Bunen when the time is right. I don't know if Hara is setting up for a red herring like it will be Heggy to take the kill, but I wouldn't mind either way. I just think it would make Heggy a standout if he's the one to slay him. Waiting is the only way to find out. The funniest part is after Katari wished him the best. As nice it was for them to wish for their safety, it's Katari's turn to say her farewell. I thought it was a perfect opportunity to show her gratitude and how her opinion changed so much. Nope, she speaks in her language, wishing to see the moment of slaying Boonin as Heki falls. Ouch. It doesn't matter though, because Heki, all serious, prays for her safety and believe her genuine words mean best wishes. Yeah. She got annoyed by his dumbfounded reaction, even though he didn't know better, so I can't really fault him, I think. I found it hilarious that Hecky even managed to pull a cool badass exit of the conversation. Look, I love the guy, but he hasn't really qualified for that exit, with his cape flapping. One day though, one day. She's definitely not on best term, but I would like to think Hecky will win her over soon. Regardless, the interaction is amusing. The chapter ends the setup stage as everyone has finally made up their match and engaged a bone chilling plan. Figo King seems to be easily aggravated or invoked as he is the last one to clash. I got a feeling that Hara is setting up for his downfall and perhaps the only one on this day. The fact he believes that the youngest brother is afraid to come out and fight sort of signal for a trap. I thought it was a gripping way to end the build up with Yotamwa feeling the sensation of being balanced on a knife's edge. It's her way of saying that this day is make or break and it can seriously lead to her end. It's the first time for the fans to witness her being in a life or death situation. It completely set the tone for this fateful day. It was a really good hype chapter that was needed to prove Heki's position in a better light. While there was a neat action here, it was solely done to prove that he can hold up well with the big dog. Nevertheless, it was done nicely and Heki's rising star power looks pretty promising. 
The visual is pretty good, capturing the tone of do or die greatly, especially concerning with your Tom was feeling. Hell is here, and it's only day one. And that will do it for the review. I hope you enjoyed this one. It's actually refreshing to have Hecky not just in the spotlight, but the tone of an underdog going against the big league. It's actually gratifying if you ask me. I like this type of story. And yeah, you could say like, well, you get all those in Shonen. True, but you can still get them in any different genre. And this one is no exception. Shin is not exactly the underdog because he has made his name really well known already. So with Hecky, it's like a restart. And this time it's actually an underdog that has no great attributes or anything that stands out significantly. So I like this type of take. So if Howard does a great job to capitalize his momentum, I would say this is even better than I expected in terms of delivering the war content. Here's hoping for an amazing payoff. What do you think of the chapter? Share your thoughts in the comment. If you like this and want more of this, subscribe to my channel and my world will be yours to stay. Until next time, take care.